Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum's virtual third Sunday lecture series. We would like to begin by thanking you for your constant support for our programming. If you would like to make a contribution to the museum to support us through the pandemic or help us bring more programs online, please go to the description box below to find a link where you can donate online securely. Before we get to today's talk, I would like to thank the sponsors that have made this lecture possible. They are Burlington Cars, 802 Cars, and People's United Bank. These businesses have made a vital investment in their community to ensure that we can still continue bringing you these presentations at no charge. Today's lecture presents a critical analysis of the ejectment trials that were at the heart of the dispute between New York and the New Hampshire Grantsmen and Ethan Allen's role in it. Today's presenter is Gary Shattuck, the co-author of Rebel and Tory, Ethan Allen, Philip Skane, and the Dawn of Vermont. Gary G. Shattuck is a New Hampshire native who served in the Vermont law enforcement community for over three decades. He received his BA from the University of Colorado, a Juris Doctor degree from the Vermont Law School, and a master's degree in military history concentrating on the Revolutionary War and attended postgraduate courses in archeology span and heritage at the University of Leicester in the UK. He served for many years as a patrol commander with the Vermont State Police and Assistant Attorney General for the State of Vermont prosecuting Vermont Drug Task Force cases. Gary went on to become an Assistant United States Attorney with the U.S. Department of Justice, where, in addition to prosecuting criminal offenses and acting as the District of Vermont's anti-terrorism coordinator and arguing cases before the U.S. Court of Appeals in the Second Circuit, he also worked as a legal advisor in Kosovo and Iraq. Since leaving government service, he has written six books and many articles on early Vermont history. Gary is also on the Board of Trustees of the Vermont Historical Society and the Vermont Historical Records Advisory Board, and is a member of the University of Vermont Center for Research on Vermont and the Fort Ticonderoga National Council. Please welcome Gary Shattuck. Thank you, Dan, and thank you to the Ethan Allen Homestead for this opportunity to come and talk to you about our uh, recent book, uh, the Rebel and the Tory, Ethan Allen, Philip Skeen, and the Dawn of Vermont that was written uh, by myself uh, and Nick Muller uh, based upon uh, information or a question that was posed by Nick's good friend, uh, John Duffy, who recently uh, is deceased. I'm gonna pull up my PowerPoint here. Uh, people that are familiar with Ethan Allen will remember that uh, Duffy and Muller wrote Inventing Ethan Allen a few years ago. And uh, based upon uh, their continuing relationship between these two gentlemen, uh, John happened to ask Nick uh, one day a question of whether or not a certain attorney uh, from New Haven, Connecticut appeared during the important ejectment trials of 1770 and 1771 uh, that involved Ethan Allen. This prompted Nick in turn to ask his own question of uh, why didn't people uh, look at Philip Skeen at the same time in any interaction he might have had with any of these people. And it was these two questions, what role did this attorney play? What effect did, he, did Philip Skeen have in the, in, the, in the New Hampshire grants that prompted the research involving the rebel and the Tory I had been previously working on uh, in uh, legal issues involving things taking place in the grants, looking at court records in the Vermont State Archives. And uh, when Nick and John started to ask their questions, they were directed into uh, to the New York Supreme Court records and that happened to be in New York City at the time. And because I knew them, they asked me if I would take a look at the records and it was based upon that and then further research into Philip Skeen, but this uh, whole story took off on in a whole different new track that none of us could have ever uh, anticipated. What we ended up doing is showing a number of relationships, uh, the context, the continuity of things that happened in the New Hampshire grants in the pre-revolutionary war uh, years that have really not been talked about to put a lot of things into perspective. The emphasis on this 
is happens to be the law essentially. And we're gonna look at land ownership and the effects of the law and how it affected the behavior of people like Ethan Allen and Philip Skeen and how it brought about the beginnings of things like the Green Mountain Boys. Unfortunately, over the years, there's been significant misinformation, mischaracterization, misinterpretation about these legal proceedings of 1770 and 71, uh, which prompted things like the creation of the Green Mountain Boys. And this, this misperception and mischaracterization has been going on for well over 200 years now. During this time, only two other attorneys looked at this time. Uh, the 1770s. That involved uh, Highland Hall, the former governor of Vermont in 1868 in his History of Vermont, and Matt Bushnell Jones in his uh, Vermont in the Making uh, in 1939. Highland Hall was in 1868. So between these are two attorneys, nobody really looked at it. Unfortunately, uh, and we, we explain it in the book, Highland Hall had a bit of a uh, a prejudicial take on it, and Matt Jones would have had more of a realistic take on it. And it was, it was just a very interesting thing for me as an attorney to now come in and look at these things from a whole different perspective because neither of these men looked at the primary sources. None of them looked at the court documents per se, of which there actually were many. And based on the research, that I undertook for a period of time, it involved going to many institutions, the New York State Archives, the Vermont State Archives, uh, to gather up all of this. And so what you have to do is try and remove any preconceptions that you have of what happened, set aside things like the statements of Ethan Allen about how bad the Yorkers were, and go back and look at the actual documents that were uh, a part of the record and see how they were misinterpreted uh, over the years. I think if you listen to the words of the state participants, it'll, a lot of things will come into a proper perspective. Now this story involving the dawn of Vermont uh, involves also a, a, uh, an attempt to create a, uh, a new colony. And anyone that's a student of Vermont would recognize, maybe not this map, but in general on the right-hand side of the Connecticut River, and then off to the left, uh, Lake Champlain on the upper left. This is a map prepared in 1771 by Simon Metcalf. Uh, this is between the two sets of trials that took place in 1770 and 71. And what we're talking about in a potential new colony was to extend from the Connecticut River across what became known as the New Hampshire Grants and extend west all the way to Lake Ontario and then north to the Canadian border. And we have to remember there was three phases to this colony project. Between 1759 and 1763, during the Seven Years' War, a barrier colony was to be set up to protect the lower colonies from invasions from Quebec. The second phase took place between 1769 and 71, during the course of the famous Brackenridge confrontation at his farm in Bennington and uh, the ejectment trials. And then immediately after the trials, uh, the rebirth of this colony project. Now, what we're talking about here is land interests. And I don't care if it's a settler, a proprietor, uh, a New York patent holder, no matter who we're talking about here, or a military uh, officer trying to get land, what we're looking at in all of these cases is title. And don't forget that title is the driving interest here. And it changes with the legal cultures that we look at. New York was separate from New England. New England had a long history of dealing with property transfers in a fee simple, fee simple manner where a person owned property wholly on their own. It also had a tradition of primogeniture where the eldest son received uh, the major benefit of a demise from a, a dying parent. On, on the other side of the coin, on the uh, New York side, we had a long history of dealing with patents issued to uh, people um, seeking large amounts of land who would in turn lease the land to people, other people. 
And so we, this thing evolved uh, from a settler proprietor um, confrontation involving uh, against the uh, against the landlords that in fact needed tenants. And let's keep this in mind. There was really, as we look at this, no intention to actually eject settlers from the land. I'll qualify this as we go along because the patent holders, the landlords needed people on the grants in order to improve the land, to comply with crown policy, to exploit the natural resources of the North American continent. This, this contest between the settlers and the proprietors also present a very interesting situation that arose right at this time that has not been discussed in the literature. This is necessary in order to understand why Ethan Allen went and did what he did, was the fact that we were dealing with law versus equity. And we don't need to get into the particulars of it, but in a legal court, there is a, a determination in a, under, after a trial, pursuant to a finding by a jury as to whether or not somebody had a title. In another alternative, in this case, border commissions that were available to deal with New York uh, border problems, those could be handled on an equitable, equitable basis uh, involving uh, people contesting uh, their right to ownership along the border. Why didn't that happen in the New Hampshire grants? We'll talk about that. There were huge consequences as a result of these famous ejectment trials of 1770 and 71. There was number one, the, uh, the validity of the titles that Benning Wentworth issued pre-1764, pre right after the time of the, uh, the Seven Years' War ended, uh, Wentworth stopped his land granting. So we're talking about his granting period in the 50s up to the end of the uh, French and Indian War. The second thing had to do with the uh, crown, famous Crown decision of July 20, 1764, that determined that the New York border was at the Connecticut River. Now, as you look at what was going on here, there was only a single person who transcended these three phases. And that was Philip Skeen, who was a captain in the British uh, Army. Uh, in 1769, he, re he uh, resigned his commission and went to work in a civil capacity uh, in, uh, in New York. We'll talk about that. He became a New York judge, a militia commander, also a very good friend of Ethan Allen's. This starts in 1759 with this colony project instigated by Jeffrey Amherst on the left, aided by Philip Skeen in the center, one of his captains, and uh, John Small also a captain of, uh, of, Ski, of uh, Amherst on the far right. People will recognize the name John Small because he was a famous plaintiff in one of the ejectment trials. This started in July of uh, 1759 when Amherst and these men took uh, Crown Point and sent the French headed uh, up the lake to, uh, to Quebec, where they were later defeated. Small on the far right was responsible for the uh, security of the men that were building the Crown Point Road between Crown Point and uh, Charlestown, Fort Number Four. Small was involved in that, appointed by, by Amherst to take care of it. And at the same time, Skeen was appointed as the person to take care of Crown Point. All of these men work closely together. And an idea, Skeen um, uh, Amherst, excuse me, came up with the idea of creating this barrier colony that stretched from the Connecticut River to Lake Ontario, but he did it in a military context without consulting with New York authorities, when ended up posing uh, quite a problem. On, in November of 1759, these are things that uh, I don't think people have ever seen before. These come from the British archives. In 1759, in November, Skeen applied for land on the south side of Lake Champlain. And we see his application on the far left here. It's written uh, November 10, uh, Crown Point Camp. On the very same, 
<clears throat> excuse me, on the very same day to the right, we see a petition that was created by six colonial uh, commanders from uh, the various colonies that worked alongside Skeen. You see a British officer on the left, you see colonial officers on the right. The ones on the right are petitioning for land along the Crown Point Road, which was called, interestingly, the New Cut Road. And so this is the beginning of the barrier. This is going to be the frontier that these men are going to create and bring in settlers. Skeen eventually obtained some land uh, in the, or he, he received permission from Amherst without formal grants of land to begin developing the south side of Lake Champlain in the, the wetlands that became known as Skeensboro in our current day Whitehall. And he began to bring in settlers. As far as these six colonial uh, colonels uh, that are the subject of the uh, petition uh, in the middle, uh, they did not receive this, work this way through the process as we talk through uh, what happened here. They did not actually receive uh, the grants per se, but some did receive other grants. In 1762, um, Wentworth was tiring of Amherst. Uh, Wentworth was demanding too much of the New Hampshire government to supply men and supplies. So Wentworth was tired of it. He began to um, fear, we suspect he began to fear how this new colony was going to intrude on his interest. And he sent people in 1762 to confront the military at Crown Point, telling them that New Hampshire extended all the way to the west side of Lake Champlain. He sent surveyors that year to Onion River to begin staking it out. Uh, he made a lot of grants at that time. Skeen and Small at the same time were sent south to Havana where the two worked in the Caribbean theater until the close of the war in 1763, after which they returned. Now in July of 1764, as this dispute between Wentworth and New York is going on over who owns this land between the Connecticut and the Hudson River. But incidentally, the, the essentially the colonial plan dies with the end of the war, there's no need for it. So we transition from a military perspective to a civil perspective. And in July of 1764, the Crown did some extraordinary things. And any student of these times knows full well that, the, that it ruled that the New York's border extended to the Connecticut River. What has not been described for over 200 years, that on the very same day, the Crown made a provision that allowed New York to resolve its border dispute with New Jersey by creating a border commission. We have two different ways of resolving border problems issued on the same day. We have one that involves equity, what is the fairness of what's going on? as provi uh, provided through a border commission that doesn't require uh, the hard application of law. And at the same time, we now have, because of Wentworth's actions, a, a uh, decision by fiat from the Crown that the border goes to the Connecticut River. Also on the same day, uh, the uh, uh, council dismissed over a dozen of Wentworth's uh, laws in New Hampshire. So clearly this was a retaliatory action against Wentworth for what he had been doing at the time. So keep in mind, here we are dealing with two ways to resolve border problems, disputes, one through equity and involving notions of fairness, the other through the application of law in which equity does not intrude. In 1765, the Stamp Act takes place uh, and then we're all aware of the contortions that a number of the colonies went through for that. Skeen goes on to develop um, Skeensboro, which uh, is in the upper left-hand corner of this map. And so this is kind of what we call in the book, the area of intrigue on the left side, Skeensboro on the upper left, and then Bennington down at the very bottom. And if you look at the map on the right, you'll see, uh, a close-up of that Bennington area. 
And so Skeen is developing the area up in Skeensboro. He becomes a judge. He becomes a New York militia commander in 1769 with authority between that point and the Canadian border. So he has an immense amount of power under the New York colony. At the same uh, earlier, uh, John Small, who we saw the picture of, receives a grant in Bennington. And we see that on the map on the right hand side. Um, just above the word Wallonshock. That's the Wallonshock patent. You'll see uh, John Small's name. You'll also see another name immediately uh, just below the word Bennington, Michael Schlater or Schlatter. And these two names become important when we talk about the ejectment trials. It's also interesting to note that a large number of uh, uh, Gage's, uh, Thomas Gage's command staff also create, uh, received land grants in the grants. And that also uh, Benedict Arnold liked the area so much, he was considering getting a grant of land in the vicinity of Skeensboro. Now in 1769 also, we have a, a problem in the New York government uh, in the collection of taxes. And this is what is going to drive the ejectment trials. So remove from your mind the thought that the patent holders wanted to eject settlers. That's just a misnomer. Ejectment is a name for the proceeding. So New York has a problem going on in 1769 and collecting the quit, rent, quit rents, the yearly quit rents from the various patents, a form of land tax. So this is an internal issue to the colony of New York, not to any other colony, just to New York. It's not aimed at any neighboring, neighbor, neighboring colonies. And what they, the New York colony decided to do was to partition these non-paying patents, which would have included a long shot patent. And it, therefore it threatened the validity of the landlord's titles. It threatened their titles. So we have a self-preservation move going on by the land, uh, by the patent holders, the New York patent holders, the, uh, the, the infamous landlords, the Yorkers as they wanted to call them, who were, had no intention of evicting, but wanted to protect their titles. Again, we're, we're not, we don't have a border commission going on here. We have ejectment um, proceedings taking place in a court of law which then forced um, the patent holders to get a hold of attorneys, um, and which included James DeWayne and a John Tabor Kemp. Uh, Kemp. What's also interesting is as, as bad as injectment law was attacked by Ethan Allen and so many others, after Vermont split off and became, its, uh, became uh, an independent, essentially an independent um, region, prior to its becoming a state, it adopted that law. It enforced ejectment law. Again, it was in order to deal with titles. Now, there were only three witnesses to the uh, ejectment trials we're gonna be talking about. In 1771, John Tabor Kemp wrote a, a letter, a report to Governor John Dunmore, uh, who the governor of New York, which essentially remained hidden in the British archives. And that's been transcribed and included in our book. In 1773, James DeWayne wrote a narrative of the proceedings, which been, has been largely ignored. In response to what DeWayne wrote about what took place during these trials, Ethan Allen wrote a brief narrative in 1774. And this is what has been cited by the historians because in this Allen, uh, disparaged the Yorkers, he disparaged their dress. He said that they had no right to appeals. And he said that the actual legal proceedings were quote, too tedious to particularize. Those are his words, he danced over them. But if you look at the primary sources that we're going to look at here, you can't dance over them because they answer so many questions as to what was happening. And as we look at these, remember that there are two things going on. There is surveying of the uh, non-paying of uh, patents you know, for prior to partitioning them. And second of all, there were suits brought on behalf of the landlords to protect the titles. Again, let's keep, in, keep this separate 
from retaliation, if you will, by Yorkers against settlers, because that's not the case. Now, the issue of due process, I'm not going to get through all of the law of, uh, of, eject of what ejectment law was, title law, but I studied a number of these cases. They were all consistent. Um, they're all uh, consistent with uh, notions of due process in the 18th century. And we see all of these things that I list here taking place during the course of the ejectment trials from the from the service of papers to the plaintiff having to prove the four elements, those are in italics, uh, to what the attorneys did when they entered uh, their appearance to represent the settlers, to the jury selection process, subpoenas, the trial process that took place. All of these things would be familiar to anybody in the 21st century. Uh, none of this is strange. The right to appeal, and then finally, if need be, a writ of ejectment issued no later than a year after the trial that was executed by a sheriff. Now, in order to show you how closely Duane and Kemp followed the law as they represented these landlords, again, we're not steamrolling over uh, settlers. We need to look at a number of the uh, original primary documents that were filed. And here we see Isaac Sawyer, who went on to the grants on uh, October the 10th, 1769. And this is, a, this is the first incident to take place prior to the first um, confrontation at James Brackenridge's farm. And on the 10th of October, what Sawyer is saying here is, I served upon um, Eliakim Walton ejectment papers. On the 14th, on the lower left, um, Sawyer goes over to Albany and he meets with an attorney, Peter Sylvester, who's a commissioner uh, authorized to take affidavits on behalf of the Supreme Court. On the 14th of October, Sawyer uh, files this notice with Sylvester saying, I serve these papers upon a number of people. This is only one of many that went on. On that same day, October 14, 1769, the surveyors meeting to partition uh, the patents over in the air, in the wall, particularly the Wallamsack patent, leave Albany and head over to uh, to the to the patent. They show up, and it panics the uh, settlers. And this I found terribly fascinating. Uh, this is from the National Archives. It leads on October 18th, the settlers to alarm settlers who have received uh, these notices from um, uh, that Isaac talked about to write to uh, Walton uh, from Isaac Sawyer uh, to write to uh, John Wentworth. And they're petitioning Wentworth, asking for assistance, saying that we have received um, a number of these notices of suit. We've been told we need to respond to them. We don't know what to do. We need your assistance. And then this is just wonderful. If you notice that the petition is only two pages, but the remaining pages that you see listed here in double columns list all of the people uh, that were alarmed by what they saw. And we see all of the names of James Brackenridge and all of the, all of the people that received um, uh, notices from Sawyer to respond to, uh, to, to the, uh, the fact that they've been uh, issued papers to uh, deal with the ejectment suits. And this shows how closely these people, all of these men were working with Sylvester, how they were fashioning their actions based upon what an attorney told them. They sent Samuel Robinson over to Albany right after uh, the surveyor showed up. And these are this is a snippet from uh, the documentary history of New York. And we know that on the 19th, um, Samuel Robinson returned from Albany with advice from Mr. Sylvester, the King attorney, and another, another gentleman, 
of note, which Brackenridge and Robinson desired them to speak to. What did Sylvester tell them? Well, we know that um, on the 24th, the town fathers from a number of towns, and we see that down on the bottom piece of paper here, also sent a second petition to uh, John Wentworth asking for assistance. And they say here, and I pulled a snippet of it, that it was Sylvester's opinion, quote, by the advice of the attorneys of that government, meaning the New York government, we are not properly under their jurisdiction. So the Brackenridge matter went proceeded based upon legal advice from an attorney. And what we see down here when the uh, town fathers from Bennington, from Palmel, from Manchester, from Arlington, from Shasper, when they all signed their own uh, uh, petition, we see the name Jaheel Hawley. Just remember that name, we'll talk about that. The men masked uh, with all those names, you saw that there were quite a few men. They masked and convinced the settlers to leave. And the, or I'm sorry, the surveyors to leave, and they did. When I saw this document in the New York State Archives, it was just, it was explosive. This is from the Supreme Court of Jud Judicature's uh, docket book from October of 1769. And on October 21, which is sufficient time for an, a, a rider or someone going down a boat getting from Albany to New York City, to notify the uh, attorneys in New York that they had already served the papers up in Albany. And based upon the civil procedure process that happened, uh, the attorneys went ahead and filed their papers. And it was this document, these are two pages, you flip it over and I didn't, I'm not providing that here, but over on the right hand side, and then continuing on to the next page, are all the people that got served with, with uh, notices of ejectment against them. This is extraordinary because all of history has said that there were only roughly six suits uh, that were filed. No, there were 18, I'm sorry, 19 suits in total involving 18 defendants. This was a huge deal. The suits that they filed, um, th these are called Missy Prius, Latin Missy Prius. These are trial court records. These things were rolled up on, or they were filled out on the right-hand side. What you're seeing is the famous case of Small versus Carpenter, which might arguably be a Vermont's uh, birth certificate, if you will. These were several feet long, and they're filled out by the attorneys as to what happens during a court procedure, and they were rolled up into scrolls. And that's how the New York archivists kept them until uh, a few years ago. And they went and unrolled those scrolls. And on the left-hand side here, you see stacks of them. And this is just one uh, grouping of them. There are many of them. And these documents uh, outline what happened in all of these different kinds of cases. Now, this is another extraordinary thing that shows up. This is from the New York Supreme Court of Judicature's writ book on regarding the papers kept by um, James Dwayne, one of the attorneys. And if you look at the top here, you'll see that in May of 1770, this is six months after the first, after the uh, filing of the charges and the uh, incident at Brackenridge's farm. If you look there, you see it was uh, William and Robert Bayard, B-A-Y-A-R-D, versus Robert R. Livingston. Robert R. Livingston, remember that name. He was the judge of the ejectment trials, one of two. Look at the next line. Um, the same type of case versus Michael Schlater. I'm sorry, it's a case involving Michael Schlater versus Josiah Fuller. Um, I talk about the use of these Latin terms and how the, there were fictitious names involved. I don't wanna take the time to do it here, but it's in the book and it seems complicated here, but it's, it uh, makes sense in the book. We see also following down there, the name of John Small versus Isaiah Carpenter. Then we see George Clark versus James Brackenridge. And we see uh, on June 6, as the trial is getting ready, Peter Quiet, to ignore the Peter Quiet, I explained why that's a fictitious name. It's nothing to get concerned about. 
versus Carpenter, the next line, Fuller. And look at, look at the third one, the Honorable Robert R. Livingston, James Brackenridge. This has never been shown before. We have a Supreme Court judge who's listed as a defendant in an ejectment trial alongside the settlers. And we'll talk about that. This, just to give you an idea how difficult it is to wade through these papers, this is the Livingston lawsuit that was filed against him. And it was filed and prepared by none other than James Dwayne, who appeared in court uh, representing uh, the landlords during the ejectment trial. So this is the quality of the papers that you know, trying to pull together this story. Now, the people we're talking about here are Robert, Livingston, Robert R. Livingston in the upper left, uh, George Duncan Ludlow, the third and fourth justices of the uh, Supreme Court of Judicature. On the lower left, we see John Tabor Kemp. This is an image from the New York Historical Society, purportedly of Kemp. It's, it's not definite, but they believe that it is Kemp. James DeWayne, who we received from the University of Vermont. And then Peter Sil uh, Sylvester, the Albany attorney that was consulting on the Brackenridge Manor, who was assisted in the trials by a, an attorney from uh, New Haven, Connecticut named Jared Ingersoll. This is the gentleman uh, that John Duffy asked about when he was talking with uh, Nick, did Ingersoll appear? So the question that has, we have to uh, ask uh, based upon the representations made by Ethan Allen in 1774 about the bias, corruption, and what have you of these men excluding the defense attorneys, um, it doesn't hold up. Allen condemned the judges and the prosecutor or the uh, plaintiff's attorneys. They weren't prosecuting, by the way. Camp, even though he was attorney general, was appearing as a private attorney, not as the AG. These people had to, had to appear in court wearing the types of gowns that were worn in England. And that included the defense attorneys, Sylvester and uh, Ingersoll. The fact that any of these men might have owned land as being biased, um, it just doesn't stand up. Yes, they did own land. Yes, at times there were probably problems within the New York court system that were not entirely kosher. But to say that these men were corrupt and cutting corners and uh, had decided the law uh, against the settlers during the ejection trial uh, just does not stand up. Now, in uh, May of 1770, Ethan Allen reportedly uh, was hired by the proprietors of the, uh, of the grants to go to Portsmouth to get papers that could be introduced during the, at the trials. Sylvester, who's the only colored picture here you see, Sylvester provided instructions to Allen, and he told them, that you needed to get exact full copies of these papers. They needed to be signed by authorized representatives of the New Hampshire government. They needed to bear the seals to show their authenticity. Now, Ira Allen, because Ethan never talked about the trials, and we'll talk about that, because, uh, because, because Allen uh, mishandled this grossly, uh, not following Sylvester's instructions. Ira Allen states in 1798 that Ethan went to Portsmouth, or went to, after leaving Portsmouth, went to New Haven, Connecticut to uh, hire Ingersoll on the, on the lower right there. There is no, absolutely no evidence at all that Ethan did this. Ingersoll was an admiralty, admiralty, admiralty judge working, recently assigned to uh, work out of Philadelphia, but who maintained residence and a practice in New Haven. I went through extensively through his records and saw no indication that he ever uh, was retained by Ethan Allen. Uh, he was also a border commissioner at will along with Benjamin Franklin based upon this crown order of July 1764, working on, the, on this border issue outside of a court process. He was also an attorney representing settlers who were being sued 
uh, by proprietors from the Nobletown Massacre of 1766. I go into it in the book, I won't do it here. But what happened was um, settlers had suits filed against them and involved British troops, uh, some of Gage's troops coming in. There was a massacre uh, that went on there. And subsequently, because of the problem, the town agent for the town of Nobletown contacted Ingersoll in New Haven and asked him to participate in June 1770 on June 26, uh, with the trials that were taking place in Nobletown. And here, this is a paper from New Haven from the Ingersoll papers. This is Kellogg writing to Ingersoll in uh, April saying that, uh, yeah, please recall that I retained your services in the case of Colonel Rensselaer and the proprietors of Western North. I now want to inform you that the trial of those cases is notified to be in the next court in Albany, which will be on uh, Tuesday, the 26th of June, uh, this is 1770. And though he says it's probable, though not certain, one of the cases will be tried. And then he goes on to say that the people of Nobletown really want you to show up and please let us know if you're gonna come. So we've got three amazing things happening on a single day on uh, June 26, 1770. We have the ejectment trials uh, involving these, these uh, number of settlers from the uh, New Hampshire grants. We have the uh, a Supreme Court justice answering as a defendant in, an, in a separate ejectment trial. We have the defendants possibly showing up uh, from Nobletown at which um, Ingersoll is supposed to represent them on. Now, another thing that's never been talked about in the literature is the important use of juries. Juries played an important, a very important role in a legal case. And even though I said that equity, concepts of equity of fairness were not um, directed by, by the judges or overseen by the judges, there was always the possibility that juries could nullify what it is they heard. If they didn't like the landlord, and on a number of occasions they didn't, and they ruled against the landlords, they would rule in and on behalf of the defendant settler. They were the conscience of the community. But at the same time, in order to receive the benefit of doubt from a jury, a defendant had to appear blameworthy. It was, you don't just come in and say that I was trampled on. You have to show that you were blameworthy and you had not done anything to, uh, uh, to not to take you outside of receiving favorable, a favorable decision from a jury. We don't need to get into this, but the purpose of this is to show you the extent of the preparation that was going on behind the ejectment trials. These are all papers that involve the jury in one way or another, from a notice on the upper left-hand corner that uh, John Tabor Kemp provided to Benjamin Kassane. He's a New York City attorney who represented uh, the Bennington defendants. It's a notice from Kemp to Kassane to appear in the uh, Supreme Court in New York to pick a jury. We have a notice from the clerk of the court below that directing these men to show up to pick a jury. We see in the very center, the list of jurors that were chosen based upon what was called the struck jury system. A, and this is, this is expensive. It took a lot of time. It took a lot of effort. And the court did not allow this Thing to take place lightly. It involved the clerk, clerk selecting the names of 48 people from the local communities, and then the, then the attorneys would come in and they could strike off 24 of them if they wanted to. The remaining 24 were summoned into court. And so what you're seeing to, for a voir dire at the time of trial, so what you're seeing in the center document are the 24 men that were summoned in from the area town surrounding the Albany, Coxsackie, uh, Catesgill, Miskayoon, uh, Mohawk country. And in the very bottom here uh, of this particular document, we see that Benjamin Kassane, the attorney for the defense, uh, refused to participate. He did not strike any. He showed up, but he didn't uh, exercise any right to strike jurors. And so when that happens, then the clerk goes in and strikes them. On the upper right, we see 
um, a subpoena, the, an example of a subpoena for a witness to appear. On the lower right, we see uh, James DeWayne's accounting of all the money that was spent for them to uh, put this trial on. And also there's an inclusion in there of payment to a man for uh, furnishing uh, beverages to the jury. Now this again, just can't state strongly enough the fear that was in Kemp's and Dwayne's mind that they were gonna lose these cases. They had a number of plaintiffs and there was a possibility that landlords were going to, they were gonna lose them because the juries didn't like landlords, which stemmed also from the fact that the Crown did not particularly care for landlords because they stood in the way of development. And they were fearful they were gonna lose the title for their landlord. But at the same time, we had the recent, or they had the 1764 Crown decision it said that New York's authority went all the way to the border or all the way to the Connecticut River. And if they received an adverse decision from the jury, it, what was the impact that it would have on land ownership from that point forward uh, involving a crown decision? Would it, would it overrule it? Um, it's just the stakes were tremendously high. And what I'm showing here, this is these, this is what uh, really adds a lot of humanity to the story. These, these are the notes kept by John Tabor Kemp. They're from the New York Historical Society. They've never been pulled out before. They were all stitched together and I was able to get the curator to uh, unstitch them and so that they all could be uh, laid out. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they're just amazing. They talk about, the facts that they had to deal with. They talk about the law. They talked about how we're going to prove our case. This is Kemp and Duane, because they're fearful that they're going to lose. They recognize their own weaknesses. Kemp writes in one point here, I wish we could give instances of acts of jurisdiction of New York. Meaning, how are we going to show New York had authority in the grants? And the answer is his own question where he says the grant of Alonsoc is one. He goes on to address and anticipate the um, evidence that the settlers were going to produce. And he talks about the specific types of evidence and how they're going to uh, oppose, seek to oppose it and convince the court uh, not to allow the evidence to come in. They don't know what evidence the, the, the settlers are going to introduce. But this is just an amazing um, insight into the minds of these two attorneys and how they were dealing with terribly complex uh, legal issues. Now on June 26, the uh, 1770, the trial start. This is Albany uh, on the left-hand side. Um, north is facing, north is on the right. You're looking west with the Hudson River down below. And people coming from the Grants would cross by a ferry over into Albany. And then you see that second pier, the, on the, from the left, that is where the Stadthuis was. That's the Dutch state house, the uh, city hall, which is on the right-hand side that you see here. And the trial took place on the second floor of that. The first trial to take place, because we have Kemp's notes of what took place. And this is in addition to the other pages I showed you. There are many pages like this of all the trials. And we see Clark versus Breckenridge up on the upper left taking place on uh, June 27. That happened not on the 26th because on the 26th was the day that Judge Livingston came off the bench and sat down at the defendant's table uh, to defend his ejectment suit of which he as a defendant um, conceded, he, he lost. So the historians have not have talked about that. Ethan Allen never talked about it. And we'll talk about further why Ethan Allen didn't want to discuss these cases. Now we come to the famous case of Small versus Carpenter, uh, which takes up, happens after Brackenridge. Allen said that uh, Brackenridge followed all these cases and that he only conceded his case uh, 
because these others went so badly, but that's not the case. Brackenridge lost his case because he was um, within 20 miles of the, uh, within, uh, with, on the west of the 20 mile line and was clearly in New York. We explain the jurisdictional issues in the book, I won't bore you here. But you see that there were a few jurors selected in Brackenridge's case, but that case ended very quickly uh, because he had to concede um, a loss. But then we look at Isaiah Carpenter and we see here this took place on the 28th and we see the names of the 12 jurors that Kemp has listed. And then he lists the course of evidence. Uh, Mr. Dwayne's open for the court and uh, then how he reads uh, Captain Small's patent to the jury. Archibald Campbell um, takes the stand. He's a surveyor and he talks about how he surveyed this land. Ebenezer Cole is a witness who talked to Carpenter. I'll talk about him in a minute. And uh, he gives evidence as to what Carpenter told him. And then here's the second page where we see Mr. Sylvester for the defendant followed by uh, entries for Mr. Dwayne. And then we see another entry for Sylvester and then Ingersoll, Sylvester, Ingersoll. Each of these men, these two men were there and, and Ingersoll did certainly appear uh, to, uh, to defend, the, defend them. And they list the reasons, uh, a number of things in opposition to the testimony that Dwayne gave. When it came Dwayne's turn, I'm sorry, uh, Sylvester's turn to introduce documents. This is the famous, famous point that all historians uh, point to. When it came to Sylvester's time to introduce proof that Small, that uh, Carpenter uh, owned this land that Small was contesting, Dwayne stood up and he objected. And I've done some snippets of those documents I just showed you there. And Dwayne said, the evidence is improper. It's not exemplified, meaning there's no sworn copy. They were partial and extracts only. They were not uh, the types of information or they were documents that did not bear the proper authentication, authenticity, easier way to say, uh, that Sylvester had given directions to Alan on. But then Sylvester stands up and he says that the evidence is incorrect is owing to ignorance. That Ethan Allen, not using his name, that the evidence is incorrect is owing to ignorance. And Ethan Allen's in the courtroom listening to this along with settlers and proprietors. And one can only wonder uh, how they felt about hearing that. We also know because Dwayne wrote of, the, of this account that Sylvester also explained further to the court that the reason these evidence was incorrect was because the settlers, and he doesn't name Ethan, but uh, Iron says it was Ethan. He says that he did not follow directions. Ethan Allen never in any of his writings, never addressed any of this never explained the directions he received from Sylvester, never explained why he brought back improper documents, never responded to Dwayne's account, never responded to Sylvester's statement that what he did was out of ignorance. So those are some major factors, I think, when you consider Ethan Allen's actions in the following uh, months. But we also know what brought this case to a conclusion was that John's, uh, that uh, Isaiah Carpenter told the witness, and uh, he writes here out here, defendant, meaning Carpenter, confesses uh, these lands are within Major Small's track. He admits that is in Small's track. Clearly, uh, it's a loser case for them. Jury verdict goes for what's a small. And then Sylvester steps in and he seeks what's called a bill of exceptions, asking the court to uh, explain why it did not allow the introduction of these documents. 
which happened to, which happened to be the town uh, charter of uh, Arlington. But the, the uh, settlers, or I'm sorry, the landlords don't take advantage of the many victories that they won on this day. They delayed for a period of time at the request of the settlers so they could try and get their, uh, their act together and come to some kind of a, a resolution. In 1771, a year later, because there were so many people served with cases and they couldn't try them all in 1770, we see in June of 1771, more of the Grant's defendants back in court, and we don't need to go through them all. This is just more of Kent's notes explaining all the jurors that are selected, all of the witnesses that were called, the testimony that they provided. And the interesting thing to a number of these is said that the jury, without leaving the bar, found on behalf of the plaintiff, meaning you know, the case was so slam dunk uh, that the jury, that the, um, they didn't have to go and confer in a back room someplace. So after it became clear that they were going to lose in a legal context, the idea of a colony uh, resurfaces. And this involved Ethan Allen, Philip Skeen, who again, I, I mentioned is a, uh, a magistrate or a, a judge over in New York and a militia commander and scheme. This is a, a pencil rendering of him joining with William Gilliland, who was the founder of Willsboro, New York, a large patent hold, holder uh, above um, Skeensboro. And between the two of them, these are the two most powerful men on the west side of Lake Champlain between Albany and uh, the Canadian border. And they decide to work with Ethan to see what they can do about reviving this colony idea. The plan is to put Skeen in as Lieutenant Governor, and then he would have his own council. Uh, he would be able to perhaps steer the proceedings to deal with these underlying title issues, which is what is continuing to drive all of this. Also at the same time, this is around 1772, after the trials, Ethan uh, goes with his uh, family members and they create the Onion River Company. The Green Mountain Boys get founded in this time period. In 1773, Skeen here on the left works with Chahil Hawley in uh, Arlington. They work as middlemen, middlemen to work with the settlers uh, in the grants with New York authorities. Holly and James Brackenridge sail to England to represent the conflicting um, take on what ought to happen. Holly, and, Holly was in favor of New York, Brackenridge was in favor of uh, New Hampshire government. Skeen goes to England also, and there he communicates with the same people that uh, Holly and Brackenridge did. Uh, Lord Dartmouth in particular. He also consults with Gage, uh, Thomas Gage, who's there uh, just prior to getting deployed uh, to respond to the intolerable acts. And he communicates with them. And he mentions this, I want to become the Lieutenant Governor of, of Crown Point in Ticonderoga. And we don't see him saying he wants to create a new colony, but you read between the lines and other communications that went on, it's clear that they're trying to revive the colony concept, which will then remove this land from New York authority, take it away from uh, New Hampshire, and then they'll be able to go ahead and resolve this title issue. But before this gets too far in December of 1773, uh, we have the Boston Tea Party. Uh, English politics is, is convulsed with how to deal with that. We have the Intolerable Acts in 74, uh, and late, um, finally at the end of 1774, uh, Skeen becomes uh, appointed by the Crown to become Lieutenant Governor of Crown Point and Ticonderoga. And this is from the British archives, it's fascinating. This is the commission and it's signed by Dartmouth on the upper right. It uh, goes from the lower left to the upper right. That just happens to be the way they recorded the commission in the uh, British archives. But it places him uh, in control 
uh, Crown Point and uh, uh, Fort Ticonderoga and the lands around it. Skeen leaves England on his way to, back to North America. He sails uh, on the Charming Sally ship between January and April, although there's a problem, there are problems within, within the colonies. They don't know that Skeen, the people on the grants don't know that Skeen has been appointed uh, Lieutenant Governor. Allen, Ethan Allen communicates with Oliver Walcott in Connecticut about his new government. Meetings take place in Willsboro, Manchester, and Westminster uh, to begin uh, considering what they're going to do uh, with the creation of a new government. March 13, we have the Westminster Massacre in April. Lexington and Concord takes place. Things are happening so quickly uh, and still they haven't heard from Skeen. They don't know what's going on. Ethan takes the position along with everybody else in the grants. Now is the time to annihilate the old quarrel with New York and swallow it up in the coming general conflict. Ethan and Arnold take Fort Ticonderoga May 10 of uh, 1775, they sack Skeen's estate. They immediately go on the offense and place him as an enemy. While Arnold works on the lake, on Lake Champlain, Gilliland petitions uh, the Continental Congress for Ethan Allen to receive a high rank and be in charge of the Green Mountain Boys. Other petitions are also formed. Ethan and Seth Warner, incidentally, Seth Warner was a defendant in the ejectment trials. Ethan Allen and Seth Warner travel to Philadelphia to meet with the Continental Congress. When they do that, Robert Cochran, Ethan's henchman, they leave Fort Ticonderoga and they head to Fort Edward in an attempt to destroy the court at Fort Edward, the Charlotte County Court, which was stopped by uh, colonial troops. In June of 1775, Skeen finally makes it to North America. He lands in Philadelphia where he's immediately arrested by members of the Continental Congress, placed under house arrest and allowed out on parole. There's a question uh, that comes up because Ethan and Seth Warner happened to be in Philadelphia at the time. Did he meet, did Skeen meet with uh, Allen at the time? We don't know. Allen is captured late in 1775. He goes on to end his captivity. In early 1777, Skeen is released, has been released the preceding November. And there's uh, in Ethan's captivity account, he says he met with a high officer of the British army. And the question is, could it have been Skeen, these two schemers who had been planning to do uh, this new colony? Did Skeen offer Ethan an opportunity to meet the king, to travel to England where Skeen was headed, to meet the king, to receive a high commission, to receive land in the grants? These are all things that Ethan says that he denied uh, accepting, but one has to wonder whether or not it was Skeen who was there uh, to, to make that offer. Skeen goes to London. He is, re he is appointed uh, to become Burgoyne's commissioner of supplies. He returns back to the, uh, to the theater of operations in the Champlain Valley. He meets up with Burgoyne. He uh, receives authority to administer oaths to loyalists. He becomes the arch Tory. He's hated by the people in Skeensboro that he hated, that he uh, uh, put in as settlers. He goes on to get uh, captured at Saratoga uh, along with Burgoyne and eventually goes home and never returns. And there in the, obviously the whole colony aspect uh, drops out of it. But I submit to you that what we're seeing here with this creation of a new colony, um, how the Grant's settlers played both sides, uh, whether they were going to uh, uh, teasingly stay affiliated with the British, whether they were going to cooperate with the Continental Congress, they certainly were against anything having to do with New York. Uh, two points, title of the land drove all of these issues. And the question was how to resolve them. Transitioning from a, a military barrier colony to civil lawsuits, to the revival of a colony, uh, in, 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 intermingled with issues over Ethan Allen's ignorance uh, in the accumulation of that evidence, 
in cases that the settlers could very well have won and it constituted a lost opportunity, uh, present a number of uh, very interesting uh, topics that have not been wholly uh, addressed by historians. And I hope that uh, those that take the time to read uh, the book of Victoria will find uh, this of interest. Thank you for this time. It's been uh, a privilege to be able to go over this. And um, thank you. Thank you for viewing Gary Shattuck's thought-provoking presentation on a critical period in Vermont's early history. If you would like to know more, three, two. Thank you for viewing Gary Shattuck's thought-provoking presentation on a critical period in Vermont's early history. If you would like to know more, we have placed links in the description box below where you can purchase a copy of Rebel and Tory, Ethan Allen, Philip Skane, and the Dawn of Vermont, as well as Gary's other books. For next month, the state of Vermont has declared September 23rd as Alexander Twilight Day. Alexander Twilight was the first black man to earn a college degree in the United States and the first African American to serve in a state legislature. We're excited to welcome Bob Hunt from the Old Stonehouse Museum to present on Alexander Twilight's life. We will see you then.